Hey, g'day, it's Prezzo here. Uh, you may recall in the last video I did, I made this quick change indicator holder and uh, I had some issues with this arm that I had made and it was partly a design error, but it was partly my stupidity when I didn't set the origin correctly for CNC machining of this curve and uh, radius on both ends. So although the unit does work, it's sort of a bit frustrating because you do need to uh, loosen these two socket head cap screws and move this arm backwards and forwards when you swap the indicator from one end of the arm to the other. The original intention was that you would never touch these screws, you would just simply unclamp this end of the arm, move the indicator down to this end and then you could uh, indicate against a face or a diameter. And uh, for someone like me who has Aspergian tendencies, uh, that sort of mistake can be really frustrating. I mean, it's stay awake at night and worry about it type of thing. So after I posted the video, I had a few people offer suggestions. They suggested that I could cut the arm in the center, um, drill and tap, fit a stud, lengthen it that way and leave it clamped down. I thought about machining up some sort of a square spacer and fitting it, anodizing it the same color and so on so that it wouldn't be so obvious that I screwed up. Uh, at the end of the day though, I said, forget it, let's just make a new arm. The only difficulty was that I didn't have any more square stock to machine it from, but I did have some 20 millimeter round stock and I've machined that down in the middle to 16 square with uh, a little bit of a radius still present on the edges. Um, I'm not bothered about that, that softened its appearance a little bit. The other issue that I had when I was machining this radius on the end of the stock was that it wasn't centered perfectly. And this is a, uh, a SIG X3 uh, mill which has been converted to CNC. Uh, when I did the last upgrade on this I fitted double ball nuts to all the axes and that should have uh, fixed all of my backlash issues with the machine. When I set the center and machined the radius it was offset and just this morning I did a few checks with the dial indicator and I, I have got some backlash in both axes the Y and the X haven't checked the Z yet um, the amount of backlash is about 0 0.09 of a millimeter which is not that big a deal but it's still annoying and the other thing that I did was I probed the edge of the stock and um, then I did the other edge worked out on the DRO the, the total distance and then halved that to find the center. Now for this to work you've got to use a, an accurate probe and I did actually buy this one. This is a TP100 um, digitizing probe. It's the type that has a, a ruby tip on a stylus and then a, a four-way contact set. Actually I think it's a five-way contact set inside this housing here. and. Uh, this should have been super accurate and the notion is that it moves across, contacts the stock, breaks the switch contact and stops the stepper motor. When I did some checks with this I realized that it's not doing that. It's actually overrunning the edge by about 0.2, uh, about, yeah, about 0.23 of a millimeter which is even worse than the backlash that I've got. And uh, I did a whole bunch of tests with dial indicators and um, I fitted in here a, a ground parallel which I knew was exactly the right or exactly a quarter of an inch uh, in thickness and uh, there was no way I could get the probe to stop against that edge without overrunning. Now maybe someone can let me know whether that is normal. I thought about it and realized that there's got to be some spring in this system uh, and it's going to require some force before it overcomes the spring tension up in here and breaks the contact. Now from the limited reading I've done it does talk about calibrating these devices and I'm not quite sure how you do that. Uh, I know that you can calibrate them in the, the z-axis. You can actually rotate them and check this with a dial indicator to make sure that it's not uh, off-center but I'm starting to wonder whether there's some sort of calibration process that has to go into the uh, probing in X and Y axes as well. So for the time being I've just not bothered with that and I've used an old school uh, wobbler or edge finder and I've 
come up onto this back edge here um, using the, the lowest jog rate that I can get um, and when I see the, the indicator go off center I've measured this with a micrometer and then moved the spindle across by half that amount plus the, the radius of the probe. So doing it that way I'm eliminating the backlash. So I've done that now and I've got this sitting on uh, the y-axis center. I've already found this end and offset by half the diameter of the probe so that I should have the x-axis center as well. So just by way of redemption I'm going to go ahead and radius this end. I've done up a, an NC code that will do both ends and I'll redrill the holes, do all the stuff that I did yesterday and um, hopefully we're going to get something that's uh, a bit more presentable because believe me I would not be able to use that other tool the way it is at the moment. It would just annoy me every time I pick it up. So let's go ahead and get this arm done and I might actually show you the um, anodizing process which a few people have commented on. Well, I don't know, that's better than what I got yesterday, but I've still got still got a hard edge on this side and I think it's probably right. It's got a tangent on the other side. I can't might know until I take it out of the vise. At least it's the right length this time. <laughs> got that right. Well, just for laughs and perhaps to show that this is going to be a better outcome, I'm going to engrave my name into this one. So I'm using a diamond drag engraving tool. These things are spring-loaded and you set the diamond tip against the surface there and then the depth of cut is going to determine how much pressure is put on that diamond stylus. So I've worked this out to 5mm depth of cut. Um, so it's going, to, it's going to engrave quite deeply into this soft material. This works really well on hard material like 4140 steel. Uh, the diamond tip really does penetrate that surface and although it's going to raise quite a big burr on this material I can file it off later. Alright, so just let me deburr that and I'll show you what that looks like when it's finished. Well, there it is. I just cleaned it up. There's a little bit of a mismatch where the, the various elements start and stop. Once again, could be, I think that is actually the, the backlash in the machine. But that's alright. Okay, well, here's the new arm. Um, it took about an hour and a half, I guess, to, to manufacture this one. It goes a lot quicker when you don't have a camera hanging around doing it, uh, and also 
once you understand the, the steps and the, the process and the workflow, it goes a lot quicker. So this new arm, um, I cut that to be exactly 170 millimetres long from end to end. I might turn that rule around so you can read it better. So 170 end to end, and the distance between centres on the clamping holes uh, 100, is 155. So that gives it enough length that I can leave that arm locked in here permanently and I don't need to disturb these two screws once that's done. The uh, block itself is 80 millimetres long and it's uh, <coughs> 40 millimetres square and uh, that seems to be sufficient for, for what I need to do. So the last step now is to anodise this arm and um, I, well, I've had one person ask me if they can see how this works so I'll show you. Um, I've done it before on one of my other videos but I've actually dialed in the process a lot better now and I can get more consistent results more often. It seems to be one of those dark arts that uh, some people say is easy, it's no problem at all and for me it just wasn't like that. It took forever to, to work out what I was doing wrong. One thing I have found about anodising at home is that uh, the results you get are completely dependent on the grade of aluminium that uh, you start with. This is one of those um, sort of five axis uh, mill by stops and I spotted this one on a channel called Build Fix Create and I've seen another one done by Tom Lipton. But the interesting thing was that both these parts were made from the same stock uh, but I don't know what it is. It was given to me as scrap, so I've got no idea of knowing what the original um, specification for this alloy was. I think it's 6061 T6, but I can't be sure. But what I did find was that these two parts anodized perfectly. These three parts came from a different type of stock. It was a, about a 32 millimeter diameter round bar. It machines differently, the chips come off as very small um, shavings on these pieces, the, the chips come off as long stringy shavings. So if you're getting dodgy results, it, it may not be the process you're using, it could be the alloy that you start with. Anyway, let's, um, we'll go and get this one prepped and we'll have a look at how to anodize this one. This is just um, emery cloth, uh, double zero grade, well worn. As we go to the next step, which is sort of um, one of these soft uh, scotch bright pads, it sort of depends on what sort of finish you want. If you're looking to get something that's ultra high precision, you've got to get the surfaces flat, not just shiny, and that means usually a lot of work with a file or plate glass and wet and dry or something like that. But I think for what I'm doing, this is going to be fine. The other tool that I do use for prepping steel parts and aluminium parts is one of these scotch bright wheels. This is a, it's a very high density scotch bright wheel. It's uh, two inches wide, eight inch diameter, and I've had this one for about, I don't know, five years, and uh, I've worn about, I don't know, 10 percent off it, and it gets a lot of use. And uh, the scrubbing action of this thing is is pretty aggressive. Um, it'll take the skin off your knuckles quicker than you can say private health insurance sucks. So um, you do need to be a little bit careful with it but for, um, for graining of material and putting that satin finish on it these things are brilliant. So 
So that's the sort of finish that I'm looking for. Um, take the view that if you try to get a, a gloss finish, like a mirror finish, every single defect is going to be visible. If you use this sort of satin finish, you can hide a lot of your um, you know, minor scratches. And I think also it's sort of less likely to get damaged in use. So um, I'm happy with that finish there now. So the next step is to clean this. So let's go and have a look. So before I start this cleaning process to prep this for anodizing, I need to be thinking about how I'm going to hold this in the anodizing bath. So the thing is that you have to electrically connect this to the anode of the power supply. And in order to do that, you've got to use either aluminium or titanium wire. And it's not good enough to just sort of hang it on a hook like that. That's not going to work. You need to have very, very close electrical contact, which usually means jamming the wire into a threaded hole like this one here, or springing the wire inside a hole so that it's forcing contact with the, the walls of the hole. Sometimes it's necessary to drill a hole somewhere in an unobtrusive place so that you can jam the wire in there. So um, I've got a, an aluminium hook here uh, and I size this so that I can jam it into that hole. But this has been in the anodizing bath previously and it's, it's actually been dyed. And the problem with that is that the anodized film makes the surface of this material non-conductive or increases the resistance. So what I'm going to do is etch off that anodizing in a bath of caustic soda. So if you ever mess up a part and you want to remove the coating, just mix up water and sodium hydroxide. I think there's about a quarter of a cup of uh, caustic soda in this solution here. And that will strip away the old anodized coating. I've already done this one. You can see it's quite bright and shiny on the end. It takes about, I don't know, 10 minutes, 5-10 minutes, depending on how aggressive you make that solution. But you should see the dye starting to run off and then you'll see it starting to fizzle and sizzle and you'll see bubbles around the surface there and so on. So I'll just etch this one off and then we'll have that ready and I'll prep it so that it's going to be a nice spring fit in that hole. Alrighty, so I'm using a glove here because what you don't want to do is leave any trace of uh, oil from your skin on that surface as you clean it. I'm going to start with simple green. Seems to be the cleaner of choice for everyone. And this is being used mainly as a degreasing agent. So it's going to give that a scrub all over. Try and pay particular attention to areas like inside those spot faces and so on. And this stuff does a pretty good job and you just have to rinse it off with water afterwards. It works even better if you heat it up. And I think in commercial um, anodizing plants they use hot solutions, uh, some very alkaline solutions to clean their parts. On a small scale it's hardly practical. Alright, so rinse that. And at this stage you should be making a note of whether the water is breaking or beating on that surface. If it is, then you've still got a lot of wax or oil or grease on there which you need to pay attention to. The last step it's just plain old Ajax and uh, this stuff, I don't know what it does, but it, it sort of activates the surface. It removes the oxide layer that might be there. Um, it's slightly abrasive, so it'll give you a, a sort of an all over even finish on the material. But I've never had it fail. I've tried skipping that step. And then I found later that the anodizing is patchy and you get sort of areas where it doesn't, uh, the dye won't take later on. So Ajax, it's cheap and cheerful. Seems to do the job.
Okay, so rinse that. All right, so having rinsed that and checked it, looking for any uh, areas where the water might be beating, the next step is just get your hook you've already prepared and jam that in, and it, it should feel tight. Now, this step, I've read different versions of how you go about this. Um, this is, once again, it's just the same caustic soda solution, and I believe that what you do is you dip that in the caustic soda, wait for it to start to bubble, and I understand that the theory here is that the oxide coating will form on aluminium very, very quickly in a matter of seconds. And this step removes that oxide coating. Uh, there's another process which is called desmutting, uh, which I never do. I've never done it. Uh, the, you need to have nitric acid to be able to do that, and it's pretty much impossible to get. So uh, the commercially made solutions are very expensive, and you can't get them through the mail. So once again, it's a bit of a dead end. The caustic soda seems to work, and uh, all it does is it just is an extra cleaning step. So you don't want to leave it in there too long, it will start to attack the surface. And then having taken it out, just rinse it off with demineralized water. And you can dip it in a, a tub full of water, but the problem there is that you slowly contaminate the water every time you do that. Okay, so I'm going to take this over now, put it in the anodizing bath, and we'll have a look. Okay, well this is my setup. It's just a plastic tub. I've got a 10 millimeter aluminium bar hanging across the top, and that's connected to the positive of my power supply. Negative goes to two cathodes, which are inside the tank. They're just strips of aluminium that are bolted through the side of the tub. The power supply is a cheap power supply I got off eBay. Uh, it's called a gopher, G-O-P-H-E-R-T, and I think this one does 5 amps up to 30 volts DC. It, it's pretty good. Um, I had a, a previous one, a uh, much cheaper one, I think it was a WEP -W brand which failed. This one's been going for quite some time now. The settings that I normally use, uh, I've, wrote, I've set it to 15 volts DC, and I just let it take as much current as it wants. There are online calculators that you can use which will allow you to input the surface area of your part and then it'll tell you a voltage and a current setting and a time setting. Now I worked to those settings for quite a long time and I just got totally frustrated. It just didn't work for me. I believe that one of the popular online calculators is used uh, in a process called low current density anodizing and I don't think that's what I'm doing here. So the last half a dozen parts I've put through this, I've just done about 15 volts. I crank up the current usually to about one amp depending on the number and size of the parts I put in there and that seems to do and I leave it in for about an hour and a half. So there are so many variables with this. It's, it is a bit hit and miss, but if you get a solution that works for you, just, just do it. So I'll, I'll show you inside the tank so you see what's going on. So you can see the part there hanging on the rail. It does have to be completely submerged. The solution that's in the tub there is just uh, demineralized water and sodium bisulfate, which you can buy from the pool shop. It's sold as a pH decreaser. It's relatively cheap. I think I bought three kilos for about thirty dollars, and uh, it's relatively safe. Uh, most of the textbooks will tell you that you need to use sulfuric acid, which of course is very dangerous. You get it on your skin, and uh, there are lots of nasty fumes, and it's difficult to get rid of. So I chose to use this uh, solution, and it seems to work for me. You can see on the side of the tank there one of the cathodes. That's a three millimeter thick aluminium sheet and it's got a gap between it and the side of the tub. There's another one on that side and you can see that there's a fine mist of bubbles coming off the cathode and you should, to a lesser extent, you should see some very fine bubbles coming off the part. So this is going to stay in the tank for around about an hour and a half. 
a time, I don't know, it, that just seems to be what works for me. Um, the power supply at the moment is set to 15 volts and I'm, it's drawing point, roughly 0.4 of an amp. Once again, I don't know if those settings are significant. I think I have the, the power supply regulated to 1 amp and it's only drawing 0.4 of an amp. So. I'm not bothered about you know forcing it up to a higher amperage. In fact, you can't. It'll just take as much current as it wants. So let's leave that for an hour and a half. We'll come back and we'll stick it in the die and see what happens. Okay, well that's been in there for about an hour and a half now, and you can sort of tell. They reckon that when it comes out, it should have a slightly greenish yellow cast to it, which is the anodized layer. So the, uh, the rinsing we're doing here is just to ensure you don't contaminate your dye bath. Now the dye that I'm using here is a Caswell Australia product but you can get it from Caswell in the US. This one's called Electric Blue. So. This um, takes between, I don't know, 10, 20 minutes, depending on the depth of anodizing that you got on the part. Certainly doesn't happen immediately. So we're just going to let that sit for a while, and we'll come back and check it. All right, that's been five minutes, and you can see the blue coloring starting on that now. So it's just a matter of leaving that in there for as long as you want and you can take it out at any point and the depth of color is going to depend purely on how long you leave it in the dye bath and how thick your anodized coating was. So um, if you're making more than one part it's fairly important you match the colors. Um, sometimes I sort of have a look at it and take it out and it's sort of like daylight and you come back to another part and it might be in the evening and you're using artificial light and then when you see them side by side they're not the same. So um, you do have to be a little bit careful, um, certainly with this blue uh, it can go almost black if you leave it in for too long. So I'm just going to check that every five minutes or so and then we'll take it out when we're happy with the colour. Okay well that's 15 minutes, I reckon it's probably got another five to go, although I don't know, maybe that's right. So that's the colour we're matching. Well, I'll just rinse that. Uh, I reckon that's it. I reckon we're there. So 15 minutes. I believe it's quicker if you heat the, the dye bath, but you've got to be careful not to overheat it because you can seal the pores on the anodized coating and it won't take up any more dye. So they recommend like 50 degrees, it'll be quicker. Uh, Alright, that's good. So we'll take it out there. The next and last step in this process is to boil this uh, just in plain water and that seals the pores off and then it will be basically finished. So let's try that. The boiling process will close over the pores that the dye leached into and once that surface is sealed the dye is locked underneath that crystalline layer indefinitely. So we're just going to let that cook away for about 20 minutes. We'll come back and do the final assembly. And there it is, a thing of beauty. Oh, there it is. I've just set this new arm in the block and tightened these two cap screws and they can stay set now. I should never need to adjust those. The entire block goes on the tool post like that. 
the indicator can go into the arm and be locked off there and now I can indicate against the diameter or you can move the block to there the indicator goes on that side and we can now indicate against the end face. So that's how it should have been right from the get-go and uh, now that I've done that I can sleep easy at night. So I guess the only remaining question then is what do I do with this old one? Hmm. Remote scriber extension arm, maybe? Oh, come on. What? Really? Okay, only one thing for it. Oh, wait. <laughs>